So welcome everyone. Today we're finishing up our worksheet on Beloved Baba. And, um, and so we're going to be working on what we need from him in order to be happy. But I'll, as always, before we do that, I'm going to read uh, a few quotes from the discourses. And so today it's from, this is pages 97 and 98. Between the two extremes of a life harassed by wants and a life completely free from wants, it is possible to arrive at a mode of practical life in which there is harmony between the mind and the heart. When there is such harmony, the mind does not dictate the ends of life, but only helps to realize those ends that are given by the heart. It does not lay down any conditions to be fulfilled before an utterance of the heart is adopted for translation into practical life. In other words, the mind surrenders its role of judge, which it is accustomed to play in its intellectual queries concerning the nature of the universe and accepts unquestioningly the dictates of the heart. And then from page 115, it's just a brief phrase, divine love arises after the disappearance of the individual mind. Divine love arises after the disappearance of the individual mind. And then this last quote is from pages 129 and 30. Traversing the spiritual path consists in undoing the results of the false working of imagination or dropping several folds of the veil, which has created a sense of unassailable separateness and irredeemable isolation. Thus far, the person had clung firmly to the idea of his separate existence and secured it behind the formidable walls of thick ignorance. But from now on, he enters into some kind of communication with the larger reality. The more he communes with reality, the thinner becomes the veil of ignorance. With the gradual wearing out of separateness and egoism, he gains an increasing sense of merging in the larger reality. That's from Beloved Baba. And then I'm going to read from Effort and Grace, pages 23. Let's see. 23 and 24 and this one and is called was that a was that a long quote i just came in i was in my therapy thing from um, discourses oh was, was it long um no it wasn't long and i can just give you the page numbers if you want to write them down uh yeah whoops i'll do that Tell me when you're ready. Okay. Ready. Okay. It was pages 97 and 98, just excerpts, but you can't go wrong by reading all of it. And then a phrase, just a phrase from page 115, which says, divine love arises after the disappearance of the individual mind. Mm -hmm. And that's on page 115. And yeah. then the last one is 129 and 130. When and now I'm going to read from Effort and Grace, page 23, on misprojection. Oh, Thank you. Yes. yes, you're welcome. Actually, we're going to do, we did that last week. We're reading Coloring of Our Thoughts on page 23 today. Great. Um, and then Darwin says, I have gathered from Meher Baba that we have to deal with our sanskaras at all levels. We are more conscious of the sanskaras at our surface consciousness, whereas in the subconscious, we may be aware of them only as feelings or impelling forces. The relationship between conscious and subconscious sanskaras is that there is some coloring of our conscious thought because of our subconscious sanskaras. In other words, when we allow sanskaras at the subconscious level to impel us into actions 
or cause us to draw conclusions about things, the effects we experience by doing so tend to confirm and solidify our misconceptions in the subconscious mind. For example, sanskaras come out into the conscious mind in the form of certain desires, which have already been formed by misconceptions in our subconscious. When we put those desires into action, we experience certain effects that are of the same nature and that concord with the original misconception, thus confirming that misconception. We may not be able to understand where all these impelling forces and feelings come from and what they involve, but as time goes on, we can become more aware of the mechanics of them as feelings or impelling forces. Then we have some intelligent control over them and not respond to them rather than be impelled to put them into action. It is like diffusing a bomb by understanding and intelligently regulating its mechanism. And, you know, just as an example of that, and we've talked about this, when we feel anger, which Baba says is a natural emotion, and if we didn't feel it, we would, would, wouldn't be any more than a stone. But when we can feel it and not express it outwardly, that's when we are doing what Darwin was just describing. So I have one more reading and this one is called, so, so Darwin was saying we're diffu it's like diffusing a bomb by understanding and intelligently regulating its mechanism. So when we're controlling our anger, it's not because of the person who triggered it in us, it's because we want to be free. You know, Byron Katie always says, do you want to be right or do you want to be free? And man, I always wanted to be right. And that was a major, major shift for me to just let it go. I would yeah. became more interested in finding my freedom and finding peace than in being right. And, um, and so that's what Darwin calls diffusing the bomb. So now I'm going to read this paragraph on page 24, seeing through misconceptions. This is all rather esoteric and difficult to communicate at the level of reason. As we rise above the realm of duality to levels of intuition and insight, we get more and more mental clarity and inner awareness about these things. This is all part of one's individual experience. My best experience of working with the subconscious were under Baba's guidance, where I would find myself plunged into the subconscious and able to work at that level. There I was able to clean house, so to speak, and remove the swarm of sanskaric mosquitoes instead of being bitten by them. We can learn how to shoo them out of our consciousness so that they no longer affect our conscious life. And, and for me, in my experience, it's, my experience isn't so much shooing them out as just letting them bite me inwardly. I have to feel the pain and all of the uncomfortable emotions. And then I notice that it just gets lighter and lighter. And I don't have as uh, intense of negative feelings as I did before. And then Darwin says, all this is why it is so important for us to evaluate our thoughts, our desires, our feelings, everything we are exposed to. And that's definitely what we're doing in the work. We are evaluating these thoughts, feelings that are the cause of our suffering. Darwin says, little by little along the spiritual path, we work to correct the misconceptions in our subconscious and to intercept the whole mechanism of sanskaric pattern formation. We learn different facts, those based on truth, to counteract our misconceptions. We will see through them and understand where they lead. And then we have to make a choice of whether we want to continue making sanskaric veils or go in a clearer direction. My own impression is that many of us allow ourselves to become inert in our habits of living. We believe in doubts. We believe in our limitations. We believe in all sorts of things that everyone else seems to believe in too. 
when actually they are not what they seem to be. And we remain at a level where there are doubts and fears and anxieties and opposites and things of that sort instead of concentrating on God or Baba and staking our lives on him. Does anybody have any thoughts they'd like to share on those readings? I had a huge revelation. Awesome. I realized that I may be suffering from guru syndrome. I want to fix everyone else. And oh my God. Wow. Well, the beauty of that in, in the light of the work is that we come to the place where we realize that it's endless. The world and everyone in it, it's like you can fix, 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 fix. But Baba says we just have to get the dust off the mirror of our mind. Of our own. And, and Katie says we have to get the dust off the, the lens of the projector of our mind. So pretty much the same message they're both giving. And I just, I think of that Titanic, you know, the endless arranging of chairs on the Titanic. That's the metaphor for me of trying to fix the world. I lived in a... That's a beautiful uh, image. Isn't that? But, yeah. you know, I lived in an intentional community for 20 years, and the unique aspect of this group was the science of the spoken word. We decreed to save the world, and I would decree hours a day. And when I finally just got tired of it and noticed that the world is the world is the world, and it's this is the dual realm. I mean, Darwin speaks so clearly about that. And, um, you know, can I just get the dust off, off my own mirror of my own mind? And, and it's a full-time job. That's all I can tell you. It's a full-time job because whatever triggers me, I have to look inside myself. And I, I can almost palpably feel what it will be like when I'm at peace with everything. And, um, and you know, that keeps me going, <laughs> you know? And that doesn't mean that we don't have discrimination and we don't see all the troubles and sorrows in the world, especially it's so intense in this world today. But you know, Baba says it's, it's all him. You know, it's like everything that's wrong is what's wrong inside of us. The, the perfect masters and Baba, they could do anything they want at any time, you know? It's like, it's, we don't have to fix anything. We well, just have to notice what we're thinking and believing. I remember the first time, the very first time I walked into what has become left of Guru Prasad in Pune, uh, which is a small room and a beautiful atmosphere. You walk in there and there's all the sayings of Baba and his picture and chair and so forth. And the first thing I see is Baba's message that says, do not try to fix anyone or be, you know, try to save anyone or help anyone before realizing yourself. Uh, wow. We just don't have that, what it takes to fix others. We just do not. Baba does. A perfect master does. Yes. Yes. We, we don't have that. That's why, yes. you know, places like um, AA exist that relinquish to the higher power because there are certain things like removing other people's sanskaras. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not in our hands at all. <laughs> that something that is in my hands and in all of you who are here, I think, have experienced this too and do daily maybe. But holding space for others is something that is within my power, like doable, at least. Yeah. Like I don't want to help people or change people or anything because I need that myself. But holding space is so valuable i think beautifully said yeah i mean real happiness does lie in making others happy um and i needed to learn 
that I couldn't leave myself in order to make others happy. I have to be with inside myself. And from that place, then I can do service. But it's like, I notice a lot of times service becomes just leaving oneself, not even paying attention, you know, to what one needs to do to take care of themselves. And I mean, just an example that came up today is we've had this lovely young woman coming to work on the outside of our house and she's staying with my son and daughter-in-law next door and she's just lovely and she needed to earn money and we needed to get our house maintained. But I found her, she fell off the ladder today and you know, she just was going to keep pushing herself. And I, I just said, no, I said, don't worry about it. Stop. You have to take care of yourself. And I think that most of us are guilty of this. And somehow in their Baba wants us to find a way to include ourselves in that circle of love. And it's, and it's an, a work in progress. It's, it's not easy in my experience. You know, sometimes it's almost easier to just leave, leave myself and go on automatic and just do what others need. But uh, I don't think that's what Baba means. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Okay. So the last three weeks we've been working on Baba. We've, we've judged Baba. The first week we worked on Baba makes it hard for us to find himself in everyone. And then what we wanted was I want Baba to make it easier for me to see him in everyone. And then last week we worked on, oh, we didn't work on that. Do you have what we worked on last week? Diantha, but we, I changed it in the middle of it. Baba, I think we worked on Baba should make it easier for us to see him in everyone. Anyway, that's, I think that's what we worked on. And this week, it's what we need in order to be happy. It's the statement for, in order for you to be happy in this situation, what do you need Baba to think, say, feel, or do? Well, that was the one we were going to do, but we didn't do it. So Here's that's okay. Last week was Baba shouldn't create this headache for himself. <laughs> no, actually, we didn't do it because oh, I realized it. that was the plan. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. What we did was we said, Baba... Baba shouldn't make it, Baba should make it easier or something like that for us. Right. We came up with one on the fly with everybody. It was on the fly because <laughs> yeah. I realized that, that it, I was going outside of the umbrella statement of the worksheet. I thought it would work because I loved Fereshte's statement about Baba, why do you create this headache for yourself? But having said that, this week we're going to work on what we need from Baba what we believe we need from Baba in order to be happy. And so we're going to work on, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. And, and so that's going to be our work today. And I'm going to read a, a letter that Moni wrote um, that, that is really in line with this. So I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. So this is um, from Letters from the Mondali, page 28. So Mani says, your letter brought deep joy, the joy that comes when one feels his love reflected in the heart of another. Beloved Baba has said, that although he has come for the many, he is for the few. We have seen that when the time comes, he awakens his few through some outward medium, and the door of the heart opens at the knock of one or another of his many hands. Although Baba's love for us is as silent as his silence is eloquent, we find a need in expressing our little love for him in one form or another. But this is truly best done when we let his love soak into our very being 
so that everything we do and say expresses that love as naturally and as simply as a flower unfolds its petals. And I just love that sentence. And so that's what inspired naturally, let us naturally express his love to everyone. Hence the part of your letter that touched me was your saying, I shall try my utmost to put his message of love and truth in my day-to-day -day life. May Baba's love bless you to carry it out. Remember never to despair at lapses or so-called failures. Just try your best and leave to him the rest. A whole span of life or even eons of lives spent towards achieving true obedience and surrenderance to the one cannot be too much when measured by his love and compassion. So that was dear Mani, whose reunion day we're celebrating today. Okay, so let's just take a few gentle breaths and everybody knows the drill. And just please unmute if you're willing to share your inquiry. Um, and then I know when it's time to go on and just relax. When we take these gentle breaths, it really helps us drop inside. We're going in and accessing that inner wisdom. That's the voice in our heart, the voice of intuition, the voice that we know as beloved Baba's. So is it true that I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. Is that true? And when we're contemplating this question, we only bring our stressful thoughts to inquiry. So we're assuming that we're not doing this. And so we're believing that we need Baba to help, help me express love naturally to everyone. Is that true? It's a conditional yes for me. Yeah. And th this is kind of a tricky one because as Baba lovers, we do, we really do, our goal is to just let Baba take over. But I would say no to this one just because I, in my heart, I believe Baba's already helping me and it's only my ego that's blocking it. So in that light, I'm gonna say no. I don't need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. And my thought and, was, I, uh, God will help those who help themselves. So I have to make the effort for him to- Yes, oh, thank you. That's perfect, I think. That's really true. And you know, it doesn't matter if you have a yes or a no. You can't, there's no wrong answers here. So for I anyone who had, go ahead. I, I get hung up on the word need, like I don't need him to do that, but I would like him to do it. Yes, yes. So the word need is assuming that we need something outside of ourself. And, you know, what I like to think of is that Baba's already living in my heart as much as I'm making room for him and he's already helping me. Um, and I, we're going to speak to that a little bit more uh, down the road, but, you know, that, I think that's a, a valuable uh, thing to contemplate. So what I'd like to do is to just move on to question two for anyone who said yes. Can you absolutely know that it's true that you need Baba to help you express love naturally to everyone. Can you absolutely know that that's true? No. No.
So how do you react? What happens when you're believing the thought, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? How do you react? And so, Diantha, you can put up the sub-questions for three to help. I, this, is, this is so you can internalize how you react and what kind of responses help us to identify how we are reacting. How am I reacting when I'm believing the thought, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? So what emotions do you feel when you're believing that thought? I immediately noticed my emotion of helplessness. I feel when I'm believing that I need Baba to help me, I'm actually feeling helpless and needy. Does anybody else notice what emotions you feel when you're believing that thought? I get confused because I feel like Baba's already doing exactly what I need for me, mm. for everybody, I think. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I would love to come from a naturally loving place to everyone. Um, but that may not be what Baba's working on me with right now. Thank you. Does anybody else want to share an emotion that they feel when they're believing, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? I think it would please Baba if I did it, but um, the word need also is problematic for me. So, yeah. Um, okay. It's uh, sorry. I would well, like to be, I would like to be more in a partnership with Baba rather than this need needfulness because that puts us back into organized religion and and getting on our hands and knees. Um, and I think if we bring Baba into our life as a companion, then he is co. He we're like become partners in crime, you know, like him and I together, uh, rather than me needing him to do something. It's like a partnership. Yes, yes. And so, and I, your comments are all valuable, and it's not how you react. Um, and so, for some, you may not even believe that it, you may never have the thought, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. If I'm believing the thought, I feel helpless. Um, and so let's just go on and notice um, if you were believing, and if you need to adjust this statement just to make it work for you, if you, be, if you can find something that you're believing that you need from Baba, I want you to notice how you're treating Baba when you're believing that thought. And so for me, when I'm believing I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone, again, I'm treating him like I'm completely dependent on him. I don't have any self-agency. Kind of like the whole thing you were just saying, Fareshte, about the organized religion. You know, kind of like the poor groveling person who has no, uh, you know, self-agency. For me, it's sort of acting as if he's depriving me mm. when he's probably not. But I'm so you treat yourself like you're deprived. Yeah, and I treat him. And he's like the depriver. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. Is it's just good to notice. And, you know, this is really why I wanted to do the work on Baba, because when I did it on my own, you know, some years ago, I realized probably ancient beliefs I had about God, you know, and that is the only reason that, that I wanted to bring it into our inquiry circle is because if you can find one, one old belief, you know, from God knows when, that we've projected onto God. And of course, you know, 
for many, it was the punishing God. And, um, and it's subtle sometimes, but I, and also one of my big takeaways when I did the work on Baba was that I was waiting for him to do a bunch of stuff that I needed to do on my own. That was my biggest takeaway, you know, and it made me much more proactive and trusting my own uh, intimations of my heart. The thing is that ultimately Baba is you. Yes. And so by trusting yourself, the higher aspects of yourself, you are in fact trusting him and, and kind of empowering his awakening within you, you know, and, and not separating the two. Absolutely. So and by, by needing something from the Baba out there, total separation. Yes. Complete separation. Yes. And I'll also say that I'm also willing to take a chance more than I was before. Um, it's like, okay, well, what if this is from my ego? You know, I guess I'll find out, you know? I mean, for instance, like giving a talk at the Circle of Friends in 2019 on, you know, Maribaba. I mean, I entitled the talk Maribaba's Mononash and the work of Byron Katie. And I mean, there were so many reactions on, to the video. Like people just thought I was the devil incarnate. And, and so I told Robin, I said, you know what? I just need to change this to Mare Baba on mine because I don't really know what Mare Baba's Mononash is, but I sure as heck, it sure seems like it if you're dismantling the limited mind, you know, stressful thought by stressful thought. But, that's just an example of maybe that was my ego. I don't know, but I'm still willing to t go out on a limb just because it's my nature, you know, to be, to, to be so passionate about finding, finding Baba and finding Baba in me and finding what needs to express. And so I got a lot of permission from doing the work on Baba. So that, that's really why I want to share this with you is, you know, what beliefs do you have about Baba, God, that limit, that limit you from just expressing your unique purpose in life? You know, we all, we all have something to share. And I think we censor ourselves a lot. And, and it is a razor's edge. I mean, it, it is, you know. And sometimes it's better to err on the side of carefulness, you know, and withholding. But for me, as long as I'm being kind, it feels pretty safe. You know, I know when my intentions are kind. Does well, anybody being else? Kind and feeling kind are different things. Say that again. Being kind and feeling kind are two different things. Acting why, do you, kind why do you say that? Because acting kind is a skill, but being kind is a transfer, complete transformation. Okay, I would say to that, that, you know, fake it till you make it. It's better to act kind and not feel it. And I think Baba talks about that too. And I can tell you one thing. When I came to the work, and I knew Baba didn't want us to backbite or criticize, I would still catch myself doing it. And then when I started doing the work and I actually saw how, not only how damaging it was to the other, but I really saw how damaging it was to myself. And I just wanted to be free. You know, I wanted to get through my stuff. That's what's helped me not criticize more than anything. And, you know, it's like whatever we're criticizing, we're projecting our own blind spots anyway. So it's just, it's a good scientific <laughs> reason to not backbite or criticize. But I think I just, Baba's best reason, excuse me, is yeah. he said, if we backbite, we get the sanskaras from the people that were backbiting. So yeah. 
it's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah, but I would forget that. And, yeah. and when I realized, I think when I realized that if I criticize someone, I'm just projecting my own stuff, and it's not an exact trade-off. You can see things in someone, you know, when you have a discriminating mind, you can see a lot of stuff. I mean, think of all the stuff Baba sees in all of us, my God. And he doesn't tell us everything about ourselves that we aren't ready to know. And so we just have to be more like that. But that wasn't enough of a reason for me. When I actually realized that it was keeping me from freedom, that was really what helped me to stop that habit. And it is a habit and it's hard. It's hard to break old habits. That was helpful, some of the things that you said as far. I was thinking that what I need to say more than I need Baba to help the sentence you had is I, I, wait, I wait for him. I try to listen to get guidance about yeah. you know, situations that are going on here that are difficult. And um, it, it helps to think that I don't need to wait. I need to act on whatever I feel like acting on and then see what happens. And I yeah. remember quite a while ago when that when I realized that because I was afraid to do anything, and um, yes, I realized that you know just do what feels right and then you'll find out whether it's right or wrong or or yeah. or not. But just do it, you know. Just not yeah, that, that for, I feel <laughs> that that's so valuable, and I think it's true for many people. You know, as long as we're really clear and we're coming from our hearts. Sometimes it's really important to say what we see um, as constructive, constructive, you know, criticism. Because I think a lot of us, you know, it's almost like the emperor has no clothes, you know, everybody pretends that he's got clothes on and, and we go on our, our ways. And, um, you know, sometimes it's better to just tell the truth. Um, something Jeff shares often, uh, he says that he, what helped him is lowering his expectations. <laughs> and he kept lowering it and lowering it and lowering it. And then he found freedom in that. Beautiful. I love that. It's, yeah. I mean, that's wisdom because that that helps us to not expect the world from we we want the world to act like they are god realized yeah and and they should not make a mistake and they should not trigger us and they should they should just be perfect beings we we want the world what we want for ourselves we want that yeah. so we want a, that beauty harmony you know everything that we long for we want it to see it outside ourselves but we got to create it inside ourselves. And the reason we do that is because it's easier to try to change everything outside of ourselves than to change ourselves. The hardest work in the universe is to change ourselves. And, you know, it's in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, Krishna talks about conquering the world is easier than conquering our own ego. And I think, for me, when I recognize that, then I have more, like, you know, it's, it's, a worthy, it's a worthy effort if I can just overcome my own anger and my own um, irritation, which is one of my specialties, and disappointment in the way the world is. And so like with, you know, Jeff lowering expectations, that's kind of the same thing in a way, just because disappointment was my middle name. I was always disappointed in something. And, and I still catch that emotion, but I don't believe it anymore. It's like, there's the, there's the fuel for my awakening. You know, can I just keep going towards Baba? And, you know, it's the hardest work in the world doing our inner work, but there's and something about, there's something about 
letting the world go, I think that that's actually the nexus to going into the inner path, the subtle world, our real path. And you know what? I want to stop here for a minute because I actually had one more uh, thing to read from Catching the Thread, pages 226 and 227, which uh, relate to what we're working on today. So we're just going to take a little break from question three here for a minute and see where see how this how this uh, aligns up with what we're working on so this is the subtitle is the teacher finds you according to the sufi tradition a teacher is necessary but how do you find a teacher as with many aspects of the quest the process of finding a teacher is very different from what you might expect you do not find a teacher, the teacher finds you. Through her aspiration and inner work, the seeker lights a lamp on the inner plane. When this light is shining brightly enough, it will attract the attention of a teacher with whom the seeker has a link, an inner connection. Then the teacher appears. The seeker may just happen to read a book or meet someone who tells her about a teacher, but such occurrences are never chance. So that's one paragraph um, that, and of course, we've all, we all know, Baba finds us, we didn't find him. And then on page 227, because the relationship with the teacher does not belong to the physical world, but to the level of the soul, it is a mysterious connection that is outside of space and time. When the moment is right, when the seeker is ready, this relationship will manifest. The teacher will be there. The teacher might live on the other side of the world or just be around the corner. The seeker might meet the teacher on the physical plane only a few times or never meet the teacher directly, but make contact through someone who follows the same path. The seeker might spend much time in the physical presence of the teacher. Whatever is needed will be given, for it is the job of the teacher to give the seeker the best opportunity to reach reality. For many people, the physical presence of the teacher is necessary until they have progressed far enough. They need the physical presence of the teacher to make the path a living reality. For others, it is the absence of the physical presence of the teacher that makes them experience the path as an inner connection. Physical presence or physical absence can both be necessary at different times. Each in its different way can help the seeker realize the inner nature of the real relationship with the teacher. When one friend was leaving her teacher almost in tears because she did not know if she would ever see her again, she was told, on this path, we do not acknowledge physical separation. And so I know Darwin has spoken to um, that it's easier to contact Baba when he's out of the body, that, that his presence became even more alive for him. So, um, you know, I think everybody here is probably in that boat, right? Nobody met Baba when he was still in the body. Anybody have any comments? Just going back a little bit, it's like such a razor's edge, it feels like to me to like I watched a little movie about voter suppression in Georgia and it was so compelling and upsetting and real and felt like it was, you know, encouraging me to, I don't know, try to figure out to do something and stuff. And, um, you know, I'm not, I was never very political and I, but I have my ways, you know, of, of um, preferring certain things. And, but, you know, this is what's being presented. This is what's happening in the world, all these different things. And, and in my life too, like it feels like none of these things should have any importance that only God should be important, but this is God, right? You know, God is, is acting out all these different things and um, reacting to some of them and not other, others of them. And it just feels like balancing on the edge of a sword or something to try to be in the world and not of the world, I guess, is a simple way to say it. And it's really a challenge. And well, you know, I just yeah. want to make room for Baba. And um, yeah. I feel like getting focused on and emotional about some of the things that are happening 
take me away from there, but it's also what he's using to push me there. So to him and to make um, him. So I, I do have a few thoughts on what you just said. Um, Baba was really clear about not wanting his lovers to be involved in politics. And I think last week I read, I read where Baba had a lover who hated Nehru, the new prime minister, and one who loved Nehru. Do, did you hear that, Robin? I don't remember that part. So the basic, the gist of the story was Baba had the one who loved Nehru to give some negative criticism about Nehru. Well, say some bad things about Nehru. And the one who hated Nehru, he made him say some good things about Nehru. And they, they went back and forth and he kept having them do it. And that's what I tell Baba lovers who get all polarized in politics. If you're gonna find, you can always find stories to back up what you're believing. And if you really want to be free, try to find some stories that give an opposing view until you can get to the place where you can see the relative value of politics. It's so dualistic. Every person in politics has good things and bad things. And if you put on your blinders and only want to see the good in one and the bad in another, you know, I think that's why Baba doesn't want people to be political. It's, it really does take us away from him. Um, and, and so that's all I'll say about that. As far as some people might have a Dharma to be in politics, but I don't think Baba lovers do. And he wanted Gandhi to leave politics. You remember that? He yeah. wanted Bobby. He, he knew what was gonna happen to Gandhi and, he's, and Gandhi's still going to be a perfect master but it was still a willful ego that made him continue to do what he was doing. So yeah, he, he basically delayed his um, coming to Baba, you know, yeah. by lifetimes, yeah. two or three lifetimes, yeah. he would have to yeah. wait. So I would be really careful about getting too, too wound up about politics. You know, it's, it's much nicer to just watch this show. Baba has it totally in hand there is no doubt in my mind he's he, he's got it covered so. well there's i don't know like ann and i signed up for a, a class where a woman is going to talk a lot about in depth and go through a lot of stuff about bigotry and um stuff like that which in a way it's not politics it's it's human nature and and trying to be get past politics and past you know yeah. trainings and I don't know and then to try to not necessarily spread it out but if you can accomplish things in your own self then it helps everybody else whether however yeah. that takes form. If, so the reason we're attracted to things is it's because that's what we need so you may have some unconscious bigotry that you're trying to bring to the surface so that you can deal with it. And that would be a reason to take a class on bigotry. Um, so I just noticed the people who are out there protesting and all that. It's because they haven't realized how to go beyond bigotry. And people who are very... Um, talking about diversity and inclusiveness, I just notice that there's only, there's, they're very selective on what they're inclusive about. So if you just know that everything you're doing is for yourself, you know, that's really it. Like for me, I do the work because I really need to do this process to bring up whatever is unconscious in me that I'm thinking and believing. And that's why I do it, and that's why I share it, because I, this is my passion. I need to stay in the work. And I noticed that Baba's words really harmonized with everything that he taught. And so that's, you know, that's it for me. Anybody else have any comments? 
So I like to tell Baba that I don't really want the world to get all medieval again. <laughs> yeah, but that's one extreme and the other extreme is totally controlled, um, you know, dictatorship or whatever, you know, it's like, do we, <laughs> but, but the thing is, it's already been written. Um, that's the beauty of it. The destiny of mankind for the next 2000 years, Baba said, he yeah. wrote the script for the next 2000 years in the SEC yeah. cave. So the only thing we have is our own, uh, you know, our own self. That's the and immediate and direct access to ba and yeah. Baba. And Baba gave us so much about, he, he didn't spend a lot of discourses on how to change the world. <laughs> and how to change others. He spent a lot of discourses on the elimination of the ego, which yeah. is, you know, here now. Yeah. And that's and all part of the script too, our journey. Yeah. It's our and I would, and I would individual's journey. He didn't really talk about collective, he talked about this, collective karma and na national karma and so forth. But for the disciple, he didn't spend a lot of time saying, go out there and change the world. And, Especially and since it's a dream. This I world do. is a dream. It's an illusion. Yeah. And so, for instance, if we uh, have fear of a dictatorship or of going medieval, then that's our work. Where, where am I a dictator? Where am I going medieval inside myself? That's what the work would, would do. Although I, I, I mean, you know, Byron Katie would say, if you're really passionate, like she would talk to environmentalists, she would say, go get educated, present your material to the powers that be, the corporations, whoever you believe is um, destroying the planet, but do it without anger. And she said, because the anger that, that, People, you know, she said she worked with recovering environmentalists because so many people were angry. And so that's polluting the planet too. Our own emotions are polluting the planet. So all we can do if we're really passionate is get educated, present, present it to the offending party and just go about our business. And, you know, it's like, it's such... A, a long-term habit of trying to change anything but ourself. And that's what I've come to see in the work. It's like, you know, we just believe our own bad press releases. I, I heard a, a very encouraging thing. I mean, uh, the scientists, maybe scientists, artists, he came up with this, ability that uh, people will paint a mural, a big mural on the side of a building, and what is in the paint helps take the toxins out of the air. I thought that was so incredible. I mean, and, and different countries are buying into this big mural. I mean, it's like a scientific fact that what is ever in the paint and I thought wow what a it's like doing what maybe so many trees would do you know and it was like wow that was such a hopeful thing I thought wow I loved it there's uh, no limit there's no limit to what love can do I mean in the blink of an eye the masters could make the world harmonious but you know what we wouldn't realize God because we haven't we haven't brought our stuff out and dealt with it, which is why the world is the way it is. And when we do that, we'll we will clearly see that everything is exactly as it needs to be. But I mean, just what Rosalie said about the paint, I believe anything like that is possible. It really is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I did want to say one thing about the politics. Uh, there was a man, Nashawan Sata. He's one of Eris Jaswala's uncles. Baba allowed him to get involved politically. He was uh, helping Gandhi in the cause, you know, to break free from uh, England and all. 
And Baba says, you can go ahead as long as you remember who your boss is. <laughs> I am your boss. Nice. And he was thrown into prison five times. It's just really interesting. And once yeah. he's, he was in prison and Dr. Ghani gave him a, a, a homeopathic manual. He became a homeopathic <laughs> doctor in prison. I mean, it was just a, just a, a beautiful story, a beautiful soul. Uh, and uh, he was one of Erich, it was a big family. Uh, and he ran a free clinic for 40 years after, you know, his political yeah. thing. You know, but it was like, so yeah. there's, there's no set rule. And, and I wonder, it's like, uh, this, the two most, what I've heard, the two most important things on the spiritual path are discrimination and a sense of humor. <laughs> I like and that. I like it because it's like, you know, you could discriminate and just be, if your intuition hasn't kicked in, you could be so off. And then yes. you could have a sense of humor about it. Okay, give it another try. You know, it's like, when I heard that one time, I thought, I like that so much because in, even in that little card, don't worry, be happy, do your best, okay. don't worry, be happy. There's, Baba has such a sense of humor on his face. It just is knockout, you know. Well, knockout. and that's, yeah. And we need to have a sense of humor and that, and Baba is so clear about that. And, you know, and then I think about politics. So let's have a sense of humor about that too. And we're going to return to our inquiry now. And I'm just asking you the question, what do you fail to see? What do we fail to see when we're believing the thought, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? What do I fail to see when I'm believing that thought? I fail to see that he already is helping me. Mm. Anybody else have something? I just noticed that I have to do my part, yeah, you know, myself. which is, which is to really, you know, for me, that means to meditate on his picture and read his words and feel his presence. That's the part I do, but I know Baba doesn't, don't they say Baba takes 10 steps to us for every step we take to him? Baba says um, that he, he needs us to kind of get out of the way and let him do the work. Oftentimes we're in the way of him doing the work and he's very patient. He just steps back and says, okay, you do it. Um, but really allowing him to do the work is by getting out of the way. Yeah. So let's move on to the last question. So you can put Baba's picture back up, Diantha. Who would you be without the thought, I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? And it's kind of like what Fareshte just said, you know, we would, we would remember what the Baba just wants us to get out of the way. So who are you without the thought? Does anybody else have a thought to share? Feels like I'm more merged with Baba. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, well, if anybody else has something to say, say it now, because we're going to move on to the turnarounds. And then so we're going to try to... Could, could go ahead, Rosalie. Question again. I, I, I had one thought that in this particular Advent, to actually see this beautiful form moving so harmoniously and fluidly and interacting with 
whatever, the multitudes. It is such a tremendous grace, you know, when I think of that. And, and I never could have even thought of posing that question, but, you know, he is the perfect human. He's the perfect human. He takes form. And, you know, of course, we would look to him for the perfection, you know, and to see it even on film now, it's, it's just over the top and out the sides and, you know, it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, With thank our you. Our technology, you know, that's the yeah. upside. Okay, I'm going to pull it back because that's my job yeah. as a facilitator. I have to keep us in the inquiry and we're going to actually finish the worksheet today. So, um, Diantha, if you could post the turnarounds. So I need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. So we're going to first do the turnaround to the self. I need me to help me express love naturally to me. That's a complete turnaround to the self. That's kind of a mind bender, but I need me to help me express love naturally to me. Find an example where that could be true. Oftentimes we leave ourselves out of the equation and we need to include ourselves before we can um, express love naturally to everyone. Does anybody have an example? I need me to help me express love naturally to myself. For me, it's about just taking some time to, to just be still and let it come to me what I need. What do I need in this moment? This is something I'm feeling very much right now, and it's why I'm going to be taking a break from doing the inquiry circles because I need, I need me to give myself some time to just be still and have a lot of emptiness. Does anybody else find an example? I like that in the effort and grace, he speaks of, Darwin speaks of the glow of love, the glow. Mm. And yeah. that's what I sort of think, you know, you, you need to, be slowed down or just to feel the glow. Mm. You know? Thank you. Yeah. And it's different for everyone and it's different at different times. Um, but like I've been noticing that I just need me to slow down. And I think that <laughs> is going to help me express love naturally to me. Okay. So anybody else have any Example, if not, we'll move on to the turnaround to the other. I need me to help Baba express love naturally. That should say to everyone. Sorry. That's a typo. I need me to help Baba express love naturally to everyone. <laughs> These are kind of like mind, mind benders, but it's not hard for me to find examples. Um, you know, can I be his hands and feet? Can I be an instrument to just love as much as I can and share it with everyone? almost seems like expressing express could be changed to reflect also i mean i know that the original word is expressed too but uh -huh. when, yeah as a yeah reflect is a beautiful way to, enough it. to reflect back the love that someone already has mm -hmm. Maybe yes well that would be more of the yin or receptive part of the love and then the expression is more of like an out an outward reaching out and they're both important 
You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Mondali, you know, uh, our dealings with them. Um, they so naturally express love outwardly. Um, and, and I'm wondering if that isn't because their ego was pretty much <laughs> nailed out. And <laughs> That's my feeling. Yeah. That's and totally my feeling. They're just transparent with maybe you know, just a pinch, had, you know. Yeah, even though they had ego. little quarrels among themselves or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know. I don't think yeah. they harbored like deep wounds or deep um, resentments yeah. or anger or anything. They just squabbled and it was over with and done with. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Baba trained them for that. So, um, I need me to help Baba express love naturally to everyone. I want, not need, I want. I want Baba to help me, to help, to help Baba express love naturally through me to everyone. That's what I want. I don't need it. I want it. I so love does, does that break the rules? <laughs> I it's okay. It. It's, it's okay. okay. It you can break the rules, you know, and it's also, it's kind of a semantical thing. Like what you, what you interpret need to be could be different than, than what Byron Katie interprets it. The, the whole point of this statement is what do you need in order to be happy? Whereas in the wants, that's where we get to tantrum and whine. Um, but you know, it all comes out in the wash. I need me to help Baba express love naturally in everyone. For me, I do have a need to, to, you know, like do what I'm doing. It's like, it feels like a need because it makes me happy. It really makes me happy to share the work uh, integrated with Baba's words. Um, and so for me, that feels like a need at this point in time, and it could change tomorrow. I have no idea. So let's move on to the turnaround to the opposite, because we're also going to finish the number five and six on the worksheet today. And Diantha and I had a lot of fun <laughs> writing. You remember that? All those terrible things about, about Baba. Oh. <laughs> I don't need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone. So the turnaround to the opposite is always our opportunity to remember that reality rules, you know, if he's not, if we're not feeling like he's doing that for us, then it's okay because that's just the way, the way it's going. It's, this is all about going beyond the mind. It's like use your mind to lose your mind. You turn the quest, you turn the statements around every which way to go beyond them. But does anybody have an example for I don't need Baba to help me express love naturally to everyone? I mean, in reality, we're all one. So it's all just happening. Perfectly. What, Robin? Perfectly. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. yeah. It, we just, we don't quite see it, but life is unfolding exactly as it has to. We're always moving closer to him. And this yeah. is how we're doing it. Maybe you don't Why need what you already have. That yeah, true? that could be true. I mean, and, and you know, different things are true for different people. So, you know, if anybody else has something to say, just say it, because we're going to move on to the next part of this worksheet. So number five says... What do you think of Baba in this situation? This is our complaint against him. You know, Baba makes it hard to find himself in everyone. And we could all find an example of someone who, you know, it was really hard for us to see him in everyone. So Diantha and I came up with some adjectives. 
What do you think of Baba in this situation? Make a list. It's okay to be petty and judgmental. So I'm going to read the whole list, and then we're going to go back one by one and break it down. Baba is enigmatic, slippery, challenging, puzzling, <laughs> impossible, cruel, untrustworthy. So what we do with this is we find where we're enigmatic. So we're saying Bob is enigmatic. You know, we can't figure him out. Dang it. Can you find, and everybody just find in yourself where you're enigmatic. And if you're believing that Bob is enigmatic. Can you just find it? Just say yes if you can find it. <laughs> I can find it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then can you find where Baba is not enigmatic? And what comes up for me is he's so clear. You know, just love me. Just love me. I mean, he's made it so clear. And so that that's an example of he's not enigmatic. What gets me about Baba is when he says, love, um, love those you cannot love. You know, that is like totally letting him do the loving. Get out of the way. I can't do it, man. So you better well, do it. It's too. our ego, though. It's our ego that can't love. Right. So this is how we get our ego rubbed out. You know, and it, I mean, it's crazy because like, like we can say, you know, you know, Hitler or Mao Zedong, I mean, all these mass murderers, they're still Baba and we have to love them. And, and, you know, I guess when we're God realized, it'll all be clear, but, you know, it's a pretty transcendent state, isn't it? So, it's so can like everybody find right? way? It's like watching a play, you know, when we go to the theater and watch a play, we're going to see the villain and we're going to see the good people and, you know, we're watching it all. We don't take home hatred for the villain when we leave the theater. It was a theater. Yeah. It, was a, it, it was a part they were playing. And remember how Bobbis says this is just a movie? Do you remember when his mother wanted him to get married to Mara and he told her, he said, that would be like, for me, that would be like marrying uh, somebody on the screen, an actress on the screen. And that's why he, he already was everything. And so, you know, the avatar, if he's realized himself before marriage, he doesn't marry. And, and if he gets married before he's, you know, completely awakened, then he's married. But it's like, how can you marry what you already know you are? So did everybody find where Baba's slippery? <laughs> <laughs> I can sure find that. Can you find where you yourself are slippery? Oh yeah. Baba is challenging. Can you find where you're challenging? And can you find where Baba's not challenging? Baba is puzzling. Can everybody find that? <laughs> and then, of course, find where he's not. And where, where am I puzzling? Yes, I puzzle myself. Baba is impossible. Can you find where I am impossible? <laughs> and where Baba is possible. Baba is cruel. Can I find where I'm cruel? And where Baba is not cruel. Every time we're doing this, we're just developing neural pathways into that right hemisphere of the brain.
that helps us just see that bigger picture of life. In other words, Baba being everything and having all attributes, good and bad, ugly and sad, <laughs> happy or mad. <laughs> uh, we are all Babas in, in works in progress. And we have all those attributes. There's no way we are not having any attributes. We have it all. Yes. And when we can acknowledge that, it's that I believe helps us to be more tolerant of everyone because I, I know what an enigma I am to myself. And so, of course, you know, the world is enigmatic too. It's just so easy for us to project our blind spot and try to label different th people and things in life. And this exercise helps us just wear down that kind of the, the, uh, the knowing mind, you know, we were saying not knowing is a wonderful place to be, you know, Bob says knowing that we don't know anything is real knowledge. We just don't know. And that's very liberating. <laughs> so Baba is untrustworthy. Well, yeah, in some ways he, he, he didn't keep his promises, but you know, Makes life interesting, doesn't it? Can you find where you're untrustworthy? Mm, all the time, I can. And can you find where Baba is trustworthy? So that's what we do with statement five on the worksheet. And then the last statement is, what is it about this person and situation that you don't ever want to experience again? And we wrote, I don't ever want to not be able to find Baba in everyone. I don't ever want to experience that again, where I can't find Baba in everyone. And then what we do with this last one is I'm willing. I'm willing to not be able to find Baba in everyone. Because guess what? It's going to happen. But we're willing because we know that what triggers us is just showing us where our work is. It means we just have to plow back into looking to see Baba in everyone that we can't see them in. And I look forward to not being able to find Baba in everyone because I really want to be free. I want to become one with Baba and I'm going to just take the path all the way to the end. Well, you so know, that's, I, I, it, it occurs to me that we can't lie to ourselves. If we see something that we quote unquote judge as one way or another, um, why don't we just say Baba is that? Baba is one way or another, rather than trying to um, negate it or lie to ourselves and say, no, it's me. Baba is, it's Baba out there. I'm looking at Baba out there. Well, I think that's a great, a great thought, you know, and, and yeah, I think it would be very helpful to do that. Because we have to be honest. Yeah. Everything is Baba. But you know, yeah. what comes up for me is, remember in um, The Violence of the Brave? You know how Baba says in The Violence of the Brave, if if you have to do violence to someone who, because they are, for example, attacking a woman or a child, Baba says in, the, in his Mer Baba on war, all the quotes are put together of everything he talks about war and violence. You know, he says that we, we have to do that. Unless you're an enlightened being, you know, it is appropriate for us then to do violence. So, I guess we could say Baba is that, that man who's abusing the woman. And then we'd still go attack him because we know that's what Baba wants us to do, to defend the woman. What do you think about that? Yeah, makes sense. But we could still say Baba's the attacker. And Baba is the attacked. Yeah. I mean, this is deep stuff. It makes me think of what Baba said about Judas. 
and how it was a setup. You know, Judas was destined to betray, betray Baba and, um, you know, and he got his liberation and all that, but he had to play that role. So everybody's playing their role. Isn't that something? I have a question. Uh, when something, like say a horrible auto accident and people, or, or you just avoided one, and people uh -huh. usually say, oh, that was a grace. But a horrible accident happens and you seldom, I seldom hear people say that was a grace. Yeah. Uh, and you know, just... it probably wouldn't be kind to say that. And it, and it just made me think of, you all probably know the girl's name who, who um, was a close Baba family, but she did she have muscular dystrophy her whole life? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And Baba told her that, you know, this was, she was going to come closer to him. Like, she was balancing so much through that. But only the avatar could say that, or a perfect master. I mean, I think it would be inappropriate, a lack of discrimination to tell somebody that was grace if they had a terrible yeah, yeah, accident, yeah. you know? It would just be, how can I help? What can I do to help? You know, and that's just kindness. And Baba often was just so like that, you know, his close ones, he could tell them things, but for others, you know, he would be so clothing his words with a lot of tenderness and comfort, you know, just depending on, on what that person needed. He actually gave that woman a choice to have that yes. or not have it. Yeah, so that was rare too. Yeah. Pretty amazing. So I have a few quotes to read. This is really interesting. Um, this is from Love Alone Prevails from Kitty Davy. And she's writing in her book, Baba emphasized that no one must expect to get happiness from others, but be happy in oneself. And I thought that was a really important reminder for us. I mean, we constantly look outside of ourselves for happiness, but it's a losing game. And so mm -hmm. the more we can remember that our real happiness is, is already within us, when we, when we, gosh, just keep remembering Baba and that he's living in our heart, that's, that's the only way that we will ever be happy. And that is um, a 24-7 ongoing lesson. And then she went on to say, <laughs> so we would try to be gay, not look moody or bored. And Baba, calling the group together, would tell us what a tiring day he had had. And with the God Mad or the Min Mandali, thus preparing us to feel sympathetic. I want to relax. I want to laugh, he would begin. You, pointing to one of the group, sing me a song to another. Tell me a story, a funny joke. If this mm -hmm. brought no response, tell me something amusing about your school days. Act something. Dance. There we sat, glued to our seats, frustrated, getting redder and hotter. Says one, I have never sung. Another, I have never danced. I am no good at storytelling. I remember no jokes. Baba goes on hammering. What? You tell me you love me and want to please me. And when I ask, you say no. What kind of love is this? Some of the group responded spontaneously. But to Rano and me, these times were a trial beyond description. Mm. <laughs> anyway, that first sentence, Baba emphasized that no one must expect to get happiness from others, but be happy in oneself. You know, they, the Mondali, they went through so much. And, you know, so we have it so easy in so many ways in comparison. And this is my final quote for today. It's from Lord Mayher, page 1631. 
And he was talking, let's see. I'm not sure where he was. Anyway, he was talking to a nurse. It was somebody, he, uh, a Westerner that he had an appointment with and she was telling him, I'm so tired of life and very unhappy. I don't see how I can improve. And Baba reassured her, everyone is unconsciously tired of this life because everyone seeks happiness but knows not how to get it. But life is so beautiful. It is meant to be happy. I will help you. Then things will appear changed. You will see it. It is always the outlook that counts and not the object. Today you feel tired, upset, seeing nothing beautiful in things around you in life. If tomorrow you do not feel bored but cheerful in the same things that appeared so black to you yesterday, it is all due to changed mentality and outlook. The easy way is not to make so much of things. Take them lightly. Say to yourself, I am meant to be happy, to make others happy. happy. And gradually, you do become happy yourself and make others happy too. Don't suggest to your mind, I am tired, haggard, depressed, etc. That will make it worse. Always say, all is well and beautiful. I will be happy. So this was our week for focusing on happiness. And we are so fortunate to have Baba. That's all I can say. <laughs> if anybody has any, anything they'd like to share, this is the time. <laughs> 